something before you come back in this afternoon uh, at the end of that meal or maybe take a lap around the, the building or block and get your uh, blood pumping again. And uh, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it. So Brother Hepton's going to come. In fact, won't, how about we show the video first? Does that work? All right. So let's hit play on that uh, video. And uh, Brother Hepton's this missionary headed to Germany to work with the military.
know, and, and there's a guy beating the drum. I was not the guy beating the drum, but I was down there, okay? That was me rowing, more or less. It was just a real high-tech way of doing it, as all, as all the nuclear power stuff is. But from the stress level and the amount of time we spend on the ship, it seems very much like that job that, where they're just rowing the galleons uh, into battle. Um, <clears throat> I served on four different submarines. Man, I don't know why I got so much stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, four different submarines. I served on the USS uh, Wyoming and the USS West Virginia. Those are ballistic missile submarines. I served on the USS West Virginia. No, USS Wyoming, USS West Virginia. Uh, ballistic missile submarines. The USS Michigan. And that was uh, what used to be a ballistic missile submarine. And they took all the nuclear missiles out of that and put in uh, tomahawk launchers. And that, that became, and then a whole bunch of stuff for the Navy SEALs. And that's called an SSGN, a guided missile submarine. And then my last submarine that you saw that it, where the whole crew was standing underneath the, uh, underneath the sub holding the banner called the USS Providence. And, that's a Los Angeles class fast attack. So my first three boats, or my first two boats, the idea is to go out and hide. The third boat is kind of to hide, but we could also attack a lot if we needed to. And the fourth boat was to go find other people who were hiding and stop them. And uh, but uh, we were, as I said, my job was very stressful. But my wife had a much stress, much more stressful job, and that is that of a Navy spouse. Um, in the military, when the military members go away, and for those of you who are veterans and, 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 have, and are associated with the military family, uh, you know that the rest of the family doesn't go with them on the deployment. They are left behind, and when that happens, there are... Um, there are things that happen and things that go on, and normally there are two parents at home to take care of it, but when the military member goes off, the spouse is left behind to do everything. That meant uh, taking care of raising the kids. That means uh, taking care of the house and the car and the, and the finances and the repairs and the maintenance and the uh, taking the kids to ball games and recitals and doctor's appointments and everything. And that's all while also trying to take care of yourself. And my wife did that for the entire 20 years we were in. Uh, we already had our son before we joined the Navy. We were married and had our son before we joined the Navy. And, and our daughter came along later, uh, just a little while later. And um, then, in addition to that, my wife was what is known as an ombudsman. When you look at our table display out there in the flags, you'll notice a little name tag from the USS Michigan. It does not have my name on it. It has my wife's name on it, and it says underneath that, Ombudsman. Uh, now, pastor might be familiar with that, and a pastor's wife might be familiar with that, but uh, if you are uh, Air Force, like Brother Serge, uh, you would know him as key spouse. Uh, I think the same thing, a oh, family readiness coordinator for the Marines uh, or, or the Army. And this is a in the Navy, a volunteer position where you are appointed by the commanding officer to be his direct representative uh, while, they're, while we're deployed. So we go away, all the families and spouses are left behind, and they, are, they come to her to be taken care of because uh, she has specialized training in all of the different programs that are available for the military uh, families to help them with different problems. And whenever, whenever we go away, it always seems like there's, there's some kind of problem going on. There's a, there's a, a, a medical problem uh, with either the children or the, the spouse, a pay problem, um, drugs, alcohol, uh, suicidal problems with either the parents, or the, the spouse, or, or the children. In fact, uh, 2019, they came out with the first, uh, for the first time, they came out with um, the statistics on tracking the numbers of military spouses and military uh, children, dependent children, for suicide, which, was, which had never been released before, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. 
Um, but there's always something going on. And they, my wife was the one that they would come to. So in addition to raising our children for this 20 years, and 17 of, that year, of those years, she was this ombudsman position, taking care of and ministering to the families. And I say ministering because she's taking care of their needs, but also because the Lord was able to be brought into those situations. And she had, uh, thankfully for the commanding officers that I had, she had free reign to, to do that. She would write out a newsletter, she would have uh, family meetings, and she was always able to bring the Lord into it and minister uh, to their needs that way as well. And uh, for, I think it was about the last three years of that that she did, she did this, she was also training others. So it wasn't just our command she was affecting, now she was beginning to affect other commands. And, um, and even today, we, we retired from the military in 2015, late 2015. And they still call her today, these, these other military spouses call her today and ask her, hey, hey uh, how do I handle this? How do I do this? How do I do that? And she's still able to, to recall and administer uh, to them. And so... Uh, that's been the, the, the thing that my wife has been able to do the in, for that entire time as minister of the military. Now, I also ministered to the military on board the submarine. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the chaplain corps uh, in the military, and I, I'm not here to badmouth the chaplain's corps. They have a very difficult job, and they do something that I won't as a military missionary, which is to go with them into combat situation. But the military chaplains have their hands kind of tied. They walk a very tightrope uh, type thing. They have on one hand the beliefs of their faith, whichever religion they happen to be, and the other hand they have the military rules and regulations that they have to follow. Now the military rules and regulations say they have to help everybody no matter what their religion is and they can't try to convert them over. Now if you're a independent, fundamental, King James-only, Bible-believing Baptist, uh, that can be really difficult to not want to share the gospel with everybody you see anyway. But to have to be able to take care of, of everybody's re religion is kind of hard. And if you're, a, if you're a military member, when you go to a base and go to the chapel, you get what they give you. You don't just have every religion in, in the chapel. You just have one or two assigned to each base, each chapel, and, and that's it. That's all you get. So uh, you imagine if you're a military member, you might, get, uh, you might get a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Wiccan or a Catholic or who knows what uh, for a chaplain. Uh, and they're supposed to help you as a, as a young believer or a, or a non-believer that you're trying to you know, reach and find God. And who knows what you're going to get. But on board the submarine, we did not have chaplains. It's too small of a, of a group of people. So we had what was called lay leaders. Lay leaders are basically non-ordained amateurs practicing, if you will, uh, kind of like a Sunday school teacher maybe. Um, but the idea is that we ran the church services underway. We... Um, we took care of if we were pulled into port, going to a church, or bringing somebody down to, to teach us or preach to us, um, and take care of looking after their spiritual needs. Again, you had those same kind of rules where you're not supposed to proselytize or evangelize, and you're not supposed to preach. But there's a real fine line between preaching and teaching. So I sat down while I taught. While you're teaching, there, there's, there's part of the difference, in, in, at least on the submarine. If I was sitting down with them at a table, then I'm, I'm teaching, I'm not preaching. But I, I can do the exact same thing as I can do standing up here um, doing that. Uh, but, you know, just taking care, watching out for them, that sort of thing. So we've been ministering to the military along those ways. And, it, and I, we also, from the moment we were saved and baptized, we began serving in the local churches uh, that we were in. In... Uh, 1999, in August of 99, my wife, uh, the neighbor in our military housing unit was Air Force, and they invited our 
children to go to an Awana program, a kids program, uh, through my wife. It was the, the military member's wife and invited our, our children through. Well, my wife is not the kind of person that will just let anybody run off with our kids. And so she decided to go w with them and uh, started going to the church, started going to um, the, the services, both of the children's thing and the regular services. And then after a little while, um, she went back. On a, she told me, I'm, hey, we're going, me and the kids are going back to church tonight. And I'm like, and I wasn't real nice about it, but I was like, why? You already been to church today. Well, I was lost. I didn't understand this. I wasn't raised in a, in a Christian home, a, a church home. Um, so I never understood this. And, and um, so we, she went back, and, and to, unbeknownst to me, she went back and talked to the pastor early and got saved. She accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She was pouring out her heart, all the things that uh, were happening, all the things that were going wrong and things that were bothering her. And she, the, the pastor stopped her and said, if you were to die, if you and the kids were to pull out of here tonight on this road and, and die, do you know that you would go to heaven? And to tell her, to tell a story, it's like somebody slamming on the brakes. And she's bawling her eyes out and slams on her brakes and says, what? Do you know for sure that if you died tonight that you would go to heaven? And she says, uh, I think so. I hope so. And the pastor, pastor, his name's Marvin Wood, still know him today says, uh, no, it's not you think so, it's you know so. Either you know or you don't know. And she says, well, then I don't know. And he said, would you like to? And she said, yes. And so he led her and showed her from Scripture, and, and she accepted Jesus Christ. And that was in August of 1999. She didn't tell me for two weeks. I can't imagine why. After the response she got from me, um, telling me that she was going back to church that night. She waited two weeks to tell me. Um, but she told another friend in the, in the cul-de-sac we were in, as a Navy family, that um, she was a Christian, but she didn't, we didn't really know that. She didn't really know that. Um, or my wife didn't, I mean. And so she, uh, she went over to talk to her, borrow a cup of sugar or something, you know, and uh, the, the lady says, What's, what's wrong with you? What's different? You're, you've been all happy all week and beaming all week. And she says, well, I got saved. And so she, being a Christian, was really happy for her. And then she came and told me some point after that. And, uh, and she'll tell you a story. I was laying on the bed, uh, laying on the bed, still at the ceiling, got my hands behind my head, looking up. And, I, and she told me, hey, I got saved two weeks ago. And she got zero response from me. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't a response. It's just there was no verbal out, outward response. I, in my head, was going, great. Now what am I going to do? Because now I've got this, this brainwashed, Bible-thumping Christian person that I've got to deal with is going to critique everything about my lifestyle and everything we, we do and I'm doing. And we just kind of, just kind of let it go from there. And she started going to church more regularly with the kids, and, and I was fine with that. I was working a rotating shift uh, with the Navy, and um, this was in Charleston, South Carolina. And um, I uh, eventually got invited to go. She invited me to go to, I think in September, there was a, a singing group that came in that sang a cappella, a men's group called Phil Cross and the Poet Voices. And uh, so they invited me to come, and I... I uh, came and, and listened to it. I got to meet the pastor and some of the people at church, and it wasn't that bad. So when I could, I started going, you know, to go with the kids. I wasn't opposed to her going to church, and I was, uh, but I wasn't, you know, all for it, and and I wasn't sure what I was going to find and that sort of thing. But uh, after a few months, in November of 1999. I was in the morning service on a Sunday morning, and the pastor preached something from the Word of God, and I honestly could not tell you to this day what it was that he preached about. All I know was that at the end of that service, when the invitation time came, there was a conviction in my heart, and I knew that I was bound for a place called hell, and that I needed to get right with God, and I needed to get saved. 
So when the invitation time came, I bolted forward, raised my hand, and as soon as it was possible to get up and go, I went. And I don't think that anybody could have stopped me right then. Um, and so I went forward, and a man named Nick Burns, one of the deacons in the church, came and, and took me around the back by the baptistry and, and sat me down and showed me from God's Word the Scriptures and what it meant to be saved and how that I could get there. And from that moment on, uh, well, that was in November. She saved in August, I was saved in November. We got baptized in December, and then starting immediately, we began serving in ministries of the church. And as our children, who were little began to grow, we began to grow right along with them in all, in all the different ministries of, of the church. And so that's kind of our, our testimony, if you will, uh, as to who we are. And we've been serving the, alongside the mil- ministries and in the military for all of this time. And the Lord has called us to full-time ministry to the military. And now, as I said, the chaplains... Um, well, they have a very difficult job, and they have to walk this tightrope. The nice thing about having military ministries or military missionaries is we are working outside of the military's control. We don't have that constraint or rule that they have. Uh, now, to the best extent possible, we do work, uh, you know, try to work cooperatively with the chaplains as long as they are cooperative. If not, well, then we'll do what we can without, you know, getting kicked off base where we can't do anything. But the, uh, where we're headed to, as I said on Wednesday, Kaiserslautern military community in Germany is the largest concentration of American military outside of the United States. There's 54,000 American military plus their spouses and their children and the civilians that work alongside them. And uh, that's where we're headed. We're headed to a already established military church plant called Rhineland Baptist Church. And that church, uh, it ranges, uh, sometimes they, they could have up to 300 people when there's a lot, of, a lot of people who've been there for a while. The problem is, with military church plants, unlike the ministry uh, uh, you know, of a normal missionary who goes and, and kind of starts a group and, and starts a church, plants a church, and then the Lord raises up a local national pastor to take over, there is no local national pastor to take over. And they just, uh, the people are just constantly transferring in and out. You know, a military member moves every, about three years, and overseas especially, a DOD tour is three years. And so they're constantly in, constantly out, constantly in, constantly out. Now the Lord provides new people, but that requires the missionaries to constantly be replanting in that same field, just like a farmer does. You know, a farmer doesn't plant one field, I mean, and he has, or, you know, one area, and then move on to a different state and plant another field. He's planting that field and work in that field or his fields in the area there and, and harvest them and continually going back and plowing and watering and planting and, and then harvesting out of the, the same fields. And that's kind of what uh, military missions is like. You're constantly having to work and rework the same, pe- same field because the people are changing out all the time. In fact, we have been back to that church. We we served there from 2004 to 2007 and, and actually served in that church and went to that church um, when we were stationed there in the military. And now we're going back, but we have been back to visit a few times and there's almost nobody there that we still know. There's the missionaries that are there, we still know them, and there's one family that's there that we still know, that he, he is retired army and his wife is German and they just live there and he works for the military base as a civilian now. Um, other than that, there's one other person that's still there that we know, and it was a retired Navy guy, or former Navy, I don't know if he's retired or not, uh, that I happened to meet just before we left and invited him to church, and he came to church, and he's still coming to church. And, and still been, he's, he works for the base exchange there, the, the military department store. Other than that, it's a whole brand new church. And then the times that we have visited there, and a couple of different times over the years we have visited there since then, each time it's another whole brand new group. We were just there in 2019, and still there's only, there's only a few of the same ones that we met there that are still there now, uh, because it's been that long, and they're, they're changing out. And the few that we know that are still there are about to leave, and they might leave there before we get there. Um. So it's, it's like going and planting a brand new church. The difference is we have the 
we have the you know, facilities already set up and the structure already set up. And we don't have to go and learn a foreign language because we're, we're coming to reach the military which already speak English. So that's a bonus for me because I can't handle too many languages. My wife is German. You wouldn't know it to talk to her, and I didn't mention this on Wednesday, uh, but she's a, from a place called Permacense, Germany, which is about 20 minutes away from where uh, we are going to be, and she does have family there. And she speaks that particular dialect. When she speaks German, you wouldn't know she's an American, and when she speaks English, you wouldn't know she's German. Uh, so uh, that is an advantage in that respect. We kind of know the area and the German culture in that area, and she speaks German, and I speak a little bit of German, not much. Um, and so we have that going for us, too. So it's kind of all, here's the other thing. I'll, I'll, I'll give my sales pitch to you, Pastor, and to church family. When you send a military missionary overseas, it's like a two-for-one deal because we're missionaries to the military, but then we can also be missionaries to the local nationals as well. Um, it's a very fruitful ministry, you ministering to the military. And I say that because um, military people are already kind of mind, have the mindset of serving. They already kind of have the mindset of, of uh, being part of something bigger than themselves. And uh, I've met a lot of pastors and, and other missionaries and evangelists and stuff who are prior military. People who are faithfully serving, just just faithfully serving in the churches. I don't want to give you too many examples of people like that, um, but you have people right here in this church who are prior military and serving. And but here's the thing: while they're still in the military, number one, when we're reaching them, they're in that age group of people who are generally the most receptive to the gospel. They are, for the first time, out on their own, away from mom and dad, on their own, with the military. They are going into places and going into harm's way, which, if you've ever heard the old adage, there are no atheists in foxholes, because you want to survive. And so they're, they're always very ready to receive compared to, to most of the population. Additionally, if they get saved and they're used to being part of something bigger than themselves, they are really ready to share the gospel with others. And they are going all over the world. So if I go and I reach a military member with the gospel and he gets saved and gets on fire for God, he gets sent into what is known as the 1040 window, where the majority of the population of the earth is, you know, around 10 to 40 uh, latitude or whatever it is, in, uh, around the equator. And a, well, a, fl- a lot of the places that we send our troops, you saw on the deployment uh, photo there, these folks are going and going and going to all of these places. And they're taking the gospel with them wherever they go. And then they come back. And they're either, like I said, they're going into the ministry? Or what are some of the other things that military members do when they come out? They go into police work. They go into government jobs, government positions, politics. They go into corporate America and, and get supervisor and leadership and management roles, management positions. Just think about how different our country would be today if our politicians, our corporate leaders... Our police, all these government positions, if they were run by people who were making biblical decisions because they were living for Christ. That's the mission field. We're trying to reach them early. I mean, it's one thing, and it's honorable to reach the veterans, but let's get them before they, before they become veterans so that when they're veterans, they can be doing things for Christ. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're going to go and reach them for the, with the gospel, they need the gospel. They need hope. I told, I think I told you guys, did I tell you guys some numbers on, on Wednesday? The first one, 5 million, 5 million souls associated with the U.S. military. The second one is greater than 50% of all first-time marriages in the military end in divorce. And the third one was 22. 22 suicides per day. 
one every 65 minutes of active duty or recently separated combat veterans. So while we're here on Sunday school hour, a military member will commit suicide. While we're here on the morning service and pastor's preaching, another one will. While we're back there having fellowship time, another one will. And then when we come back in here and have the morning service, the afternoon service, I mean, another one will. And that's just that short period of time, but it happens every hour, just about, of every day, all through the year. And the reason is because they do not have that hope. They do not have the understanding of their sins are forgiven. Whatever they've seen, whatever they've done, whatever they've been involved in, it's forgiven. God can forgive them. That there is hope for something better later and, to deal, and, and help them to deal with that. That's why the divorce rate is so high for first-time marriages and that's why the suicide rate is, is so high because they don't have that hope. We're going to go, we're going to reach them with the gospel, pray that they get saved. When they get saved, get them involved in the church, get, start discipling them. Before they leave, where, where we're at, if they're transferring or they're getting out and going home, before they leave, we want to get them in contact with a good Bible-believing church, Bible-teaching church, wherever they're headed. Now that is also why it's so important to have military missionaries everywhere there is a duty station, uh, both overseas and back home. Now back home you have local churches, and local churches can function normally and have a military outreach, but overseas there's, they don't have that, so you have to have that kind of military-only church. And so that's us, uh, and that's our ministry. I wanted to leave you with just a, if I can get my iPad to open here. Quick, quick thought. The population of Perryville, Missouri is approximately 8,496. How long would it take you guys, this church, to reach that population with the gospel? All of it. Now, an internet search shows that there are six Baptist churches in Perryville, Missouri. I'm not taking into account they might be uh, not all independent or fundamental or KJV. Or they might be Calvinists or free wills or whatever. Just that as the title Baptist, they have the best chance of hearing the gospel from those people. That's uh, If I divide up that population by each of those six Baptist churches, that's 1,416 people is your share to reach. How long would it take you? To make the math simple, it would be 141 people per year if it would take you 10 years. Could you do it? 141 per year for 10 years. What if you had to reach them in just three years? In order for your whole church to be able to reach them in all in three years, you'd have to reach 472 each year. That's 39 per month for three years straight. That doesn't take into account any population growth or people who die or move out of the area before you reach them. Can you reach them all here? You can if you are all actively telling people about Jesus. Everybody, not just the pastor, everybody. There's a story that's been told, and you've probably heard it before. It's even been in a commercial, but it makes the perfect illustration. One day, a man was walking along the beach, and he noticed a little boy uh, picking up something and then throwing it into the ocean. And he gets closer, and he sees that he's throwing starfish into the ocean. And he says, what are you doing, son? And he says, he says, the tide is going out and these starfish are washed up on the shore and if I don't throw them back, they'll die. And the man looks down the beach and says, there's miles and miles of beach and there's hundreds and hundreds of starfish. You can't make a difference. The boy listened politely, bent down, picked up another starfish and threw it out into the ocean. And he looked at the man thoughtfully and said, I made a difference to that one. 
We may say we can never reach them all, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Because for the ones that you can reach, it will make a difference for all of eternity. Matthew 9.36, But when they, he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. I said there's 54,000 American military plus their families in Germany at, at, at Kaiser Slaughter in the area we're going. There's only two churches and four missionary couples once we get there. For us to reach them all in that, that window, that's 4,500 each year or 375 each month for each missionary couple, each missionary couple. That's more than 9.6 times what your whole church would need to do to reach reach here. And some of those military personnel are going to deploy away from there for as much as a year at a time during their time stationed there. And every three years they're moving, as I said, so that number is fluid. It's not just a constant sitting still 54,000. But they still need to know. They still need to be reached. And like the little boy in the story, my wife and I is not going to be able to reach all of them but we can't stop trying because it will make a difference for the ones that we do reach. Churches get a lot of missionaries coming through saying, support me, support me. And they present the ministry that God's called them to. And you might as say, as many have said, we can't support them all. But that doesn't mean that you don't support the ones that you can. Because, like again, like the little boy from the story, it will make a difference for them and for the ones that they will reach with the gospel. The new recruiting slogan for the military is, their success tomorrow begins with your support today. So I'm here asking for myself. I'm also asking for the Dice family, because he's not here to ask for himself right now. Um, Can you please support us? Uh, so that we can reach others and make a difference for them. Thank you. Brother? All right. Before we dismiss, let me just encourage you to get the thought. Currently, our church supports 22 missionaries or agencies. That's, that's a blessing all by itself um, to me. Um, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited about the potential and possibility of supporting more missionaries because the need is great and uh, our time is short. Um, You know, I I was doing some research for the message this morning um, and based on the calculations, the numbers, statistics, there are seven billion eight hundred and seventy four million nine hundred and sixty five thousand eight hundred and twenty five people on the planet earth as of this year that's a bunch of folk and why does the gate that leads to destruction and many there be which go in thereat But narrow is the gate that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Statistically, and the information we have from the Scripture, most folks are not going to end up in heaven. Sad, but true. Unfortunate, as that might be, that's what the Lord has given us, uh, uh, projected for us. But it's not that he's not willing to save every single one of them. But two things are required. First of all, they have to hear. Second of all, they have to respond. Now, I can't control the response of anyone. But I do, and I, I can have control over whether they hear it or not. So... Are we going to reach ours? And are we going to do what we can to reach as many as we can reach? Um, 
I would just encourage you to pray. Pray about your part in that. You say, well, I, I don't have much money. Well, I'm, I'm not saying you have to give what I give. I'm not saying you have to go like he's going. But we ought to give something. And we ought to go as far as we can. I wouldn't mind visiting Germany, but that's not where God's called me to. God's called me to here. He's planted me here, which means there are people here that I can tell. I don't have to go outside of the county line to tell the people that God has provided for me to tell. And if God hasn't provided me a six-figure salary income, then I probably am not going to be expected by God to, to provide giving based on a six-figure income. Maybe I'm just a young person that gets an allowance or a little something for mowing the grass, but like the little kid with the starfish, you don't have to give everything, but that doesn't mean you couldn't give something. And just so you know, missionaries give as well. My daughter had me fill out her missions commitment card. She's still committed to this church, and she still gives two missions through this church. Her commitment has been included in our faith promise. She, she gave of herself, but she's still giving to reach beyond where she is. It brings me to tears to see her standing on the streets handing out Gospels and John and Romans to passers-by in cars. But it's not tears of sadness, it's tears of great joy. Because I know she's doing what she can do where she's at. All the while participating to do what she can beyond where she's at. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You got about six minutes, fellowship. Visit our table, pick up a card. The Dice family left some missions cards. I saw some on the, on the foyer out there. And I did encourage them uh, strongly to come back through here uh, for a Sunday service uh, when they had opportunity. So uh, hopefully you'll get to meet them at some point if you didn't get to stop in this week. Let's be dismissed. Father, thank you for the time. Thank you for the opportunity to do something for missions and, and the, the, the work of the gospel around the world. And I pray that you would bless the Dices and the Heppens and provide for them and give us wisdom as a church family as to whether you would like us to uh, come alongside them and support them financially and prayerfully and, and uh, guide us as to what we can do. And then guide each and every one of us as far as our individual commitments and what you'd have us to do and what you'd like to provide through us uh, for the missions program at Heartland Baptist. We ask for your blessing on this next hour and that you would do and accomplish your will in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Those of you that are in the foyer can come on in and the rest.